Joseph Lister Fights Infection Joseph Lister, a freshman medical student, watched the first use of ether in England in December of 1846. He was a serious-minded young man, shy, and he spoke with a bit of a stammer. Joseph's father warned him against becoming a surgeon. The father thought surgery would be too brutal for his kind-hearted son. Joseph Lister saw that ether took surgery into a new era. Anesthesia made all the difference. He decided to become a surgeon. After earning his medical degree, he took a position at the Glasgow Scotland Hospital. Despite the success of anesthesia, surgery still terrified patients, and with good reason. Doctors ignored Pasteur's germ theory of disease, just as they had ignored Semmelweis. Patients still died after surgery, not of pain or shock, but from infection due to unclean conditions in the hospitals. One man came to Dr. Lister to have a mole removed from his face as a favor for his new bride. The operation was simple. Three days later, however, infection set in. The man died. Lister asked himself, what is the use of operating on a patient if he is to die of infection? He checked the hospital records. In Joseph's own hospital, about two in five surgery patients died. In Paris, about three in five. Munich, Germany held the grim record. Four in every five of the cases ended in death. City officials threatened to burn the hospital if conditions didn't improve. Older doctors still quoted Galen. Infection is useful. The pus cleans the wound and helps healing. If wounds didn't develop infection naturally, doctors applied rough dressing to cause pus to appear. Joseph Lister looked for a better answer. An important clue came from his treatment of broken bones. Glasgow was an industrial town. The city's machinery sent its share of broken bones and mangled bodies to the hospital for treatment. Fractures were of two types, simple and compound. A simple fracture was one which the leg or arm was broken, but the bone did not come through the skin. A simple fracture could be set and would heal without difficulty. Patients with simple fractures seldom developed a fever. No infection set in. Usually the patient fully recovered. A compound fracture was one in which the broken bone cut through the flesh and was exposed to the air. Despite Lister's best efforts, the place where the bone stuck out of the skin got red. The wound began to develop an unpleasant odor. The patient ran a fever. Finally, in more than half of the cases, the patient died. Broken bones of the compound type posed a terrible danger to the patient. Time and time again, Joseph Lister watched the terrible cycle. Redness, swelling, infection, pus, fever, and finally death. How could he break the cycle? He talked it over with Professor Thomas Anderson, a friend and chemist. Joseph asked, If a fracture is a compound one, so that the bone pokes through the flesh, the patient is unlikely to recover. Why the difference? Professor Anderson told Dr. Lister about Louis Pasteur. Pasteur is not a medical doctor at all. He is a chemist like myself. He believes that tiny living things in the air can drop into an open wound. He claims these tiny germs are the cause of disease. You may be right, Joseph Lister agreed. Simple fractures heal because the broken bone isn't exposed to germs in the air. Professor Anderson said, Pasteur has developed a way to stop the growth of germs by heating them. But I can't heat patients until the germs die, Lister said. That would kill the patient too. Maybe a chemical would stop them. Do you have any suggestions? Carbolic acid may work, his friend said. The Germans use it when sewers start to smell. Joseph was surprised. An acid? Professor Anderson explained. Unlike sulfuric acid, carbolic acid is very weak. 
It may be strong enough to kill germs, yet not so strong as to damage the flesh around the wound. Joseph Lister experimented with a sample of garbolic acid. He sniffed it and drew back. It smelled terrible, but he decided to try it on the next compound fracture that came into his ward. He didn't have long to wait. A boy named James Greenless was admitted to the hospital. A heavy wagon had run over the boy and broken his leg. The bone protruded through the flesh. Lister painted the edges of the wound in the protruding splinters of the bone with carbolic acid. He set the bone, dressed the wound with a piece of cloth dipped in carbolic acid, and bound the leg. Lister cared for the boy personally. When at last he took off the bandages, a scab covered the wound. The leg healed normally. His patient left the hospital with his leg as good as new. Lister continued to look for ways to avoid germs. Most doctors washed their hands after a surgical operation. Lister washed his hands before as well. Most doctors wore dirty operating coats with dried blood on them. Lister, on the other hand, wore a clean linen apron. He became the first white-robed doctor. Doctors used silk string to sew up incisions. They carried short lengths of string looped through the buttonholes of their coats. When they needed to tie an artery or sew up a wound, they simply pulled one of these threads out of the buttonholes and used it. Often the flesh around the stitching became infected. Lister noticed this. He soaked his threads in carbolic acid before using them. The hospital made bandages and dressings of worn-out sheets, towels, and tablecloths donated by members of church groups. Most hospitals did nothing before using them. They didn't even wash the bandages before putting them on wounds. Lister insisted upon more soap, clean towels, and washed bandages. The board of governors who ran the hospital grumbled at this extra expense. They believed it to be a waste of money. Lister kept everything clean. He washed surgical instruments, the operating table, his hands, and the patient. The results astonished him. Surgery became much safer. His record of patients who survived was unbelievable. In fact, some doctors didn't believe him. They called him a liar. Lister learned to ignore the controversy. His personality radiated peace and love. He visited the patients daily and changed their bandages himself. Most surgeons employed assistants, known as dressers, to do this work. Lister asked his patients if he could do anything to make them more comfortable. Once he came into the wards to find an eight-year-old girl crying. What's the matter? he asked the girl. Gently he sat on the edge of the bed beside her. The girl stopped sniffling. The nurse took away my doll. The nurse explained, The doll has a torn leg. Sawdust is leaking out. Lister took the doll and gravely sewed up the leg. He treated the doll with as much care as his human patients. The girl got well, and so did her doll. Even kind-hearted gestures like this drew fire from critics. You are setting a bad example, they said. Doctors must be held in awe and respect by their patients. At the age of 50, Lister moved to King's Hospital in London. The London doctors openly resented his successful surgery. For a time, they refused to send nurses to help him in the operating room. Lister, a Christian, had a gentle nature, an even temper, a determined will, and an unselfish character. He overlooked their harsh words. He said, My results speak for themselves. By 1875, Lister had won over the rest of the world. German doctors in Munich put his methods to work. Lister toured Europe and saw in person the change at the Munich hospital. Its dismal record of four deaths out of every five patients had improved to less than one death in 200 patients. Its dismal record of four deaths out of every five patients had improved to less than one death in 200 patients. The German doctors didn't use carbolic acid. 
Instead, German surgeons boiled instruments and sponges to be used in operations. Lister tried it himself. It is not the presence of acid that matters, he concluded, but the absence of germs. Dr. Lister's discovery became known as antiseptic surgery. The word antiseptic is the combination of anti, meaning against, and septic from a Greek word meaning to make rotten. An antiseptic prevented the growth of the germs that attacked human flesh. Carbolic acid was not entirely satisfactory to use as a disinfectant. Its action was too harsh on human flesh. Chemists took up the challenge and discovered solutions less irritating to human tissues and even more deadly to germs. Dr. Joseph Lawrence developed a disinfectant that could be used during surgery without damaging human tissue. Later, it was manufactured and sold by Jordan Wheat Lambert and William R. Warner as an effective mouthwash. They called it Listerine. At last, doctors couldn't deny that Joseph Lister had been right. Hospitals became sparkling clean. Joseph Lister outlived his critics. He became a hero. During the last 30 years of his life, he died in 1912 at the age of 84. He enjoyed immense respect. A grateful world showered honors upon him. He became the first physician to belong to the House of Lords, part of the British Parliament. Scientists elected him president of the Royal Society. He became physician to the Queen of England. Today, Dr. Joseph Lister is considered the greatest surgeon of all time. Like so many other great scientists who were also Christians, he was a humble and gracious man. The combined work of Leeuwenhoek, Samuelweis, Pasteur, and Lister established that germs cause disease and that keeping germs from entering the body prevents infection. This discovery is one of the top ten medical discoveries.